Chapter 29 of McClellan's Own Story. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mike Manalakis. McClellan's Own Story by George Brinton McClellan. Chapter 29. The Army at Harrison's Bar. Indecision at Washington. The Harrison's Bar Letter, Army Ordered Home, Protests of McClellan, On the Bank of the James River the Fate of the Union Should Be Decided, Transportation Not Provided, Withdrawal of the Army, Transfer to Front of Washington. When the troops reached the James, the first want of the men was something to eat and drink, and the next a bath in the river. As I rode among the men they would cry to me for their supper and upon my assuring them that they should have it, they would give their usual cheers and be perfectly content. For two or three days after we reached Harrison's Bar, the banks of the river were crowded all day long with the men bathing. It should be understood that in time of action, every army reduces itself to two of unequal strength. One, the fighting men, who stick by their colors as long as life and strength last, and are ever ready to meet the enemy the other consisting of the weaker men, and those prone to straggle, and those not too fond of unnecessary combat. The better the discipline of the army, the larger the first category, and vice versa. It must be confessed that the contingent of stragglers was pretty large on our arrival at the James, but after a day or two all had rejoined their colors and were ready for work again. A very few days sufficed to give the men the necessary rest, and the army was then in condition to make any movement justified by its numbers, and was in an admirable position for an offensive movement. It was at last upon its true line of operations, which I had been unable to adopt at an earlier day in consequence of the Secretary of War's preemptory order of the 18th of May, requiring the right wing to be extended to the north of Richmond in order to establish communication with General McDowell. General McDowell was then under orders to advance from Fredericksburg, but never came, because, in spite of his earnest protest, these orders were countermanded from Washington, and he was sent upon a fruitless expedition towards the Shenandoah, instead of being permitted to join me, as he could have done, at the time of the affair of Hanover Courthouse. I urged in vain that the Army of the Potomac should remain on the line of the James, and that it should resume the offensive as soon as reinforced to the full extent of the means in possession of the government. Had the Army of the Potomac been permitted to remain on the line of the James, I would have crossed to the south bank of that river, and while engaging Lee's attention in front of Malvern, had made a rapid movement in force on Petersburg, having gained which I would have operated against Richmond and its communications from the west, having already gained those from the south. Subsequent events proved that Lee did not move northward from Richmond with his army until assured that the Army of the Potomac was actually on its way to Fort Monroe, and they also found that, so long as the Army of the Potomac was on the James, Washington and Maryland would have been entirely safe under the protection of the fortifications and a comparatively small part of the troops then in that vicinity, so that Burnside's troops and a large part of the Union Army of Virginia might, with entire propriety, have been sent by water to join the army under my command, which, with detachments from the west, could easily have been brought up to more than 100,000 men disposable on the actual field of battle. In spite of my most pressing and oft-repeated entreaties, the order was insisted upon for the abandonment of the Peninsula Line and the return of the Army of the Potomac to Washington, in order to support General Pope, who was in no danger so long as the Army of the Potomac remained on the James. With a heavy heart, I relinquished the position gained at the cost of so much time and blood. As an evidence of my good faith in opposing this movement, it should be mentioned that General Halleck had assured me, verbally and in writing, that I was to command all the troops in front of Washington, including those of Generals Burnside and Pope, a promise which was not carried into effect. On the 1st of July, I received the following from the President. It is impossible to reinforce you for your present emergency. If we had a million of men, we could not get them to give you in time. We have not the men to send. If you are not strong enough to face the enemy, you must find a place of security and wait, rest, and repair. 
Maintain your ground if you can, but save the army at all events, even if you fall back to Fort Monroe. We still have strength enough in the country, and we'll bring it out. In a dispatch from the President to me on the 2nd of July, he says, If you think you are not strong enough to take Richmond just now, I do not ask you to. Try just now to save the Army materiel and personnel, and I will strengthen it for the offensive again as fast as I can. The governors of 18 states offer me a new levy of 300,000, which I accept. On the 2nd of July, the following was received from General Barnard. Private. Headquarters, July 2nd, 1862. Dear General, It seems to me the only salvation is for this army to be ready promptly to reassume the offensive. For this we must immediately push our forces further forward or we are bagged. Besides being able to shell us out, the enemy will entrench us in, and shutting us up here with a small force be off for Washington. The fresh troops, how many? The fresh troops, how many? now here or on the river, ought to enable us to push out at once and to assume an offensive as soon as our old army can be rested. But we need large reinforcements. The state of affairs is concealed in Washington to hide their own blunders, and the country will not respond to the crisis unless it is known. We need 200,000 more men to fill up the ranks and form new regiments. A large part of Halleck's force, all that can be withdrawn, should come from the West. There is no use in writing. Should you not send at once an officer who will not be afraid to speak? And though such a messenger does not open his lips except to Lincoln and Stanton, the public will soon know that there is something concealed. It should be done by all means. Today we must get ourselves enough out to save being shut in. There is no use in entrenching a line of no real utility, and what Duane can do today will only wear out his men for nothing. It is troops alone that can help us today. By tomorrow we will be able to know where to entrench. We must have fresh troops immediately in large numbers, and I would, if necessary, abandon Norfolk and New Bern to get them, and all the useless coast of South Carolina and Georgia, holding only Fort Pulaski. Pensacola is of no use, but I suppose may be held with few troops. Yours, etc., J.G. Barnard. On the 3rd of July, the following was received from the President. Yours of 5.30 yesterday is just received. I am satisfied that yourself, officers, and men have done the best you could. All accounts say better fighting was never done. 10,000 thanks for it. On the 4th, I sent the following to the President. July 4th, 1862. I have the honor to acknowledge the receipt of your dispatch of the second instant. I shall make a stand at this place and endeavor to give my men the repose they so much require. After sending my communication on Tuesday, the enemy attacked the left of our lines, and a fierce battle ensued, lasting until night. They were repulsed with great slaughter. Had their attack succeeded, the consequences would have been disastrous in the extreme. This closed the hard fighting which had continued from the afternoon of the 26th Ultimo, in a daily series of engagements wholly unparalleled on this continent for determination and slaughter on both sides. The mutual loss in killed and wounded is enormous, that of the enemy certainly greatest. On Tuesday morning, the 1st, our army commenced its movement from Hacksaws to this point, our line of defense there being too extended to be maintained by our weakened forces. Our train was immense, and about 4 p.m. on the 2nd, a heavy storm of rain began, which continued during the entire day until the forenoon of yesterday. The roads became horrible. Troops, artillery, and wagons moved on steadily, and our whole army, men, and materiel was finally brought safe into this camp. The last of the wagons reached here at noon yesterday. The exhaustion was very great, but the army preserved its morale, and would have repelled any attack which the enemy was in condition to make. We now occupy a line of heights about two miles from the James, a plain extending from there to the river. Our front is about three miles long. These heights command our whole position and must be maintained. The gunboats can render valuable support upon both flanks. If the enemy attack us in front, we must hold our ground as we best may and at whatever cost. Our positions can be carried only by overwhelming numbers. The spirit of the army is excellent. Stragglers are finding their regiments, and the soldiers exhibit the best result of discipline. Our position is by no means impregnable, 
especially as a morass extends on this side of the high ground from our center to the James on our right. The enemy may attack in vast numbers, and if so, our front will be the scene of a desperate battle, which, if lost, will be decisive. Our army is fearfully weakened by killed, wounded, and prisoners. I cannot now approximate to any statement of our losses, but we were not beaten in any conflict. The enemy were unable by their utmost efforts to drive us from any field. Never did such a change of base, involving a retrograde movement and under incessant attacks from a most determined and vastly more numerous foe, partake so little of disorder. We have lost no guns except 25 on the field of battle, 21 of which were lost by the giving way of McCall's division under the onset of superior numbers. Our communications by the James River are not secure. There are points where the enemy can establish themselves with cannon or musketry and command the river, and where it is not certain that our gunboats can drive them out. In case of this, or in case our front is broken, I will still make every effort to preserve at least the personnel of the army, and the events of the last few days leave no question that the troops will do all that their country can ask. Send such reinforcements as you can. I will do what I can. We are shipping our wounded and sick and landing supplies. The Navy Department should cooperate with us to the extent of its resources. Commodore Rogers is doing all in his power in the kindest and most efficient manner. When all the circumstances of the case are known, it will be acknowledged by all competent judges that the movement just completed by this army is unparalleled in the annals of war. Under the most difficult circumstances, we have preserved our trains, our guns, our materiel, and above all, our honor to which I received the following reply from the President. A thousand thanks for the relief your two dispatches of 12 and 1 p.m. yesterday gave me. Be assured that the heroism and skill of yourself, officers, and men is and forever will be appreciated. If you can hold your present position, we shall hive the enemy yet. The following letter was received from His Excellency the President. July 4th. I understand your position as stated in your letter and by General Marcy. To reinforce you so as to enable you to resume the offensive within a month or even six weeks is impossible. In addition to that arrived and is now arriving from the Potomac, about 10,000 I suppose, and about 10,000 I hope you will have from Burnside very soon, and about 5,000 from Hunter a little later, I do not see how I can send you another man within a month. Under these circumstances, the defensive for the present must be your only care. Save the Army first where you are if you can, and secondly, by removal if you must. You on the ground must be the judge as to which you will attempt and of the means for effecting it. I but give it as my opinion that, with the aid of the gunboats and the reinforcements mentioned above, you can hold your present position, provided, and so long as, you can keep the James River open below you. If you are not tolerably confident you can keep the James River open, you had better remove as soon as possible. I do not remember that you have expressed any apprehension as to the danger of having your communications cut on the river below you, yet I do not suppose it can have escaped your attention. P.S. If at any time you feel able to take the offensive, you are not restrained from doing so. The following telegram was sent on the 7th to the President. As boat is starting, I have only time to acknowledge receipt of dispatch by General Marcy. Enemy have not attacked. My position is very strong and daily becoming more so. If not attacked today, I shall laugh at them. I have been anxious about my communications. Had long consultation about it with Flag Officer Goldsboro last night. He is confident he can keep river open. He should have all gunboats possible. We'll see him again this morning. My men in splendid spirits and anxious to try it again. Alarm yourself as little as possible about me and don't lose confidence in the Army. While General-in-Chief and directing the operations of all our armies in the field, I had become deeply impressed with the importance of adopting and carrying out certain views regarding the conduct of the war which, in my judgment, were essential to its objects and its success. During an active campaign of three months in the enemy's country, these were so fully confirmed that I conceived it a duty, in the critical position we then occupied, not to withhold a candid expression of the more important of these views from the Commander-in-Chief whom the Constitution places at the head of the armies and navies, as well as of the government of the nation. 
Mr. Lincoln visited me at Harrison's Bar. I handed him myself, on board of the steamer in which he came, the letter of July 7, 1862. He read it in my presence, but made no comment upon it, merely saying when he had finished it that he was obliged to me for it, or words to that effect. I do not think that he alluded further to it during his visit, or at any time after that. The Harrison's Bar Letter Headquarters, Army of the Potomac, Camp near Harrison's Landing, Virginia, July 7, 1862. Mr. President, you have been fully informed that the rebel army is in the front with the purpose of overwhelming us by attacking our positions or reducing us by blocking our river communications. I cannot but regard our condition as critical, and I earnestly desire, in view of possible contingencies, to lay before Your Excellency, for your private consideration, my general views concerning the existing state of the rebellion, although they do not strictly relate to the situation of this army or strictly come within the scope of my official duties. These views amount to convictions and are deeply impressed upon my mind and heart. Our cause must never be abandoned. It is the cause of free institutions and self-government. The Constitution and the Union must be preserved, whatever may be the cost in time, treasure, and blood. If secession is successful, other dissolutions are clearly to be seen in the future. Let neither military disaster, political faction, nor foreign war shake your settled purpose to enforce the equal operation of the laws of the United States upon the people of every state. The time has come when the government must determine upon a civil and military policy covering the whole ground of our national trouble. The responsibility of determining declaring and supporting such civil and military policy, and of directing the whole course of national affairs in regard to the rebellion, must now be assumed and exercised by you, or our cause will be lost. The Constitution gives you power sufficient even for the present terrible exigency. This rebellion has assumed the character of war. As such it should be regarded, and it should be conducted upon the highest principles known to Christian civilization. It should not be a war looking to the subjugation of the people of any state in any event. It should not be at all a war upon population, but against armed forces and political organizations. Neither confiscation of property, political executions of persons, territorial organization of states, or forcible abolition of slavery should be contemplated for a moment. In prosecuting the war, all private property and unarmed persons should be strictly protected, subject only to the necessity of military operations. All private property taken for military use should be paid or receipted for. Pillage and waste should be treated as high crimes. All unnecessary trespass sternly prohibited, and offensive demeanor by the military towards citizens promptly rebuked. Military arrests should not be tolerated except in places where active hostilities exist and oaths not required by enactments constitutionally made should be neither demanded nor received. Military government should be confined to the preservation of public order and the protection of political rights. Military power should not be allowed to interfere with the relations of servitude, either by supporting or impairing the authority of the master, except for repressing disorder, as in other cases. Slaves contraband under the Act of Congress seeking military protection should receive it. The right of the government to appropriate permanently to its own service claims to slave labor should be asserted, and the right of the owner to compensation, therefore, should be recognized. This principle might be extended upon grounds of military necessity and security to all the slaves within a particular state, thus working manumission in such state, and in Missouri, perhaps in western Virginia also, and possibly even in Maryland. The expediency of such a measure is only a question of time. A system of policy thus constitutional and conservative, and pervaded by the influences of Christianity and freedom, would receive the support of almost all truly loyal men, would deeply impress the rebel masses and all foreign nations, and it might be humbly hoped that it would commend itself to the favor of the Almighty. Unless the principles governing the future conduct of our struggle shall be made known and approved, the effort to obtain requisite forces will be almost hopeless. A declaration of radical views, especially upon slavery, will rapidly disintegrate our present armies. 
The policy of the government must be supported by concentrations of military power. The national forces should not be dispersed in expeditions, posts of occupation, and numerous armies, but should be mainly collected into masses and brought to bear upon the armies of the Confederate States. Those armies thoroughly defeated, the political structure which they support would soon cease to exist. In carrying out any system of policy which you may form, you will require a commander-in-chief of the army, one who possesses your confidence, understands your views, and who is competent to execute your orders by directing the military forces of the nation to the accomplishment of the objects by you proposed. I do not ask that place for myself. I am willing to serve you in such position as you may assign me, and I will do so as faithfully as ever subordinate served superior. I may be on the brink of eternity, and as I hope forgiveness from my Maker, I have written this letter with sincerity towards you and from love for my country. Note by the editor, it has been frequently intimated that this letter was written in consultation with friends at the North as a political document. It was the misfortune of McClellan that civilians at Washington, judging him in their own lights, could not conceive it possible that he or any man could render honest, unselfish service to country and cause without some concealed purpose of benefit to himself. Pure devotion to duty without thought of self is incomprehensible to the average politician. I think it proper to say, therefore, that no one of McClellan's most intimate personal friends at the North knew even of the existence of this letter until rumors about it came from members of Mr. Lincoln's cabinet. None of them saw it until the general was finally relieved from command. Meantime, it had been discussed thoroughly by those to whom the president showed it, and it cannot be doubted that a general inability to appreciate the sincere motives in which it was written did much to determine the future conduct of the administration towards McClellan. Mr. Chase, with startling innocence of mind, avows, Warden, page 440, that on July 22nd he urged Mr. Lincoln to remove McClellan on the ground that I did not regard General McClellan as loyal to the administration, although I did not question his general loyalty to the country. This is the confession of a motive in the conduct of a great war which is universally regarded as infamous. It is an avowal that the controlling consideration of such leaders as Mr. Chase, in the use of the blood and treasure of the people, was the supremacy of party and not the success of country. Neither the President nor General McClellan had any such impure ideas, and it is beyond doubt that the radical difference between his own views and those of the self-seeking men who surrounded him led Mr. Lincoln to the despairing state of mind in which, a few weeks later, he desired to resign. End note. Very respectfully, your obedient servant, George B. McClellan, Major General Commanding. His Excellency A. Lincoln, President. I telegraphed the President on the 11th. We are very strong here now so far as defensive is concerned. Hope you will soon make us strong enough to advance and try it again, all in fine spirits. Telegrams were sent to the President on the 12th, 17th, and 18th. 12th. I am more and more convinced that this army ought not to be withdrawn from here, but promptly reinforced and thrown again upon Richmond. If we have a little more than half a chance, we can take it. I dread the effects of any retreat upon the morale of the men. 17th. I have consulted fully with General Burnside, and would commend to your favorable consideration the General's plan for bringing seven additional regiments from North Carolina by leaving New Bern to the care of the gunboats. It appears manifestly to be our policy to concentrate here everything we can possibly spare from less important points to make sure of crushing the enemy at Richmond, which seems clearly to be the most important point in rebeldom. Nothing should be left to chance here. I would recommend that General Burnside, with all his troops, be ordered to this army to enable it to assume the offensive as soon as possible. 18th. I am anxious to have determination of government that no time may be lost in preparing for it. Ours are very precious now, and perfect unity of action necessary. The following was telegraphed to General Halleck on the 28th. My opinion is more and more firm that here is the defense of Washington, and that I should be at once reinforced by all available troops to enable me to advance. Retreat would be disastrous to the army and the cause. I am confident of that. On the 30th to General Halleck, I hope that it may soon be decided what is to be done by this army, 
and that the decision may be to reinforce it at once. We are losing much valuable time, and that at a moment when energy and decision are sadly needed. About half an hour after midnight on the morning of August 1st, the enemy brought some light batteries to Coggins Point and the Coles House, on the right bank of James River, directly opposite Harrison's Landing, and opened a heavy fire upon our shipping and encampments. It was continued rapidly for about 30 minutes when they were driven back by the fire of our guns. To prevent another demonstration of this character and to ensure a debauch on the south bank of the James, it became necessary to occupy Coggins Point, which was done on the 3rd, and the enemy driven back towards Petersburg. On the 1st of August, I received the following dispatches from General Halleck. Washington, July 30th, 1862, 8 p.m. A dispatch just received from General Pope says that deserters report that the enemy is moving south of James River and that the force in Richmond is very small. I suggest that he be pressed in that direction so as to ascertain the facts of the case. Washington, July 30th, 1862, 8 p.m. In order to enable you to move in any direction, it is necessary to relieve you of your sick. The Surgeon General has therefore been directed to make arrangements for them at other places and the Quartermaster General to provide transportation. I hope you will send them away as quickly as possible and advise me of their removal. It is clear that the General-in-Chief attached some weight to the report received from General Pope, and I was justified in supposing that the order in regard to removing the sick contemplated an offensive movement rather than a retreat, as I had no other data than the telegrams just given from which to form an opinion as to the intentions of the government. The following telegram from him strengthened me in that belief. Washington, July 31, 1862, 10 a.m. General Pope again telegraphs that the enemy is reported to be evacuating Richmond and falling back on Danville and Lynchburg. H.W. Halleck, Major General. In occupying Coggins Point, I was influenced by the necessity of possessing a secure debauch on the south of the James in order to enable me to move on the communications of Richmond in that direction, as well as to prevent a repetition of midnight cannonades. To carry out General Halleck's first order on July 30th, it was necessary first to gain possession of Malvern Hill, which was occupied by the enemy, apparently in some little force, and controlled the direct approach to Richmond. Its temporary occupation at least was equally necessary in the event of a movement upon Petersburg, or even the abandonment of the peninsula. General Hooker, with his own division and Pleasanton's cavalry, was therefore directed to gain possession of Malvern Hill on the night of the 2nd of August. He failed to do so on account of the incompetency of guides. On the 4th, General Hooker was reinforced by General Sedgwick's division, and having obtained a knowledge of the roads, he succeeded in turning Malvern Hill and driving the enemy back towards Richmond. The following is my report of this affair at the time. Malvern Hill, August 5, 1862, 1 p.m. General Hooker at 5.30 this morning attacked a very considerable force of infantry and artillery stationed at this place, and carried it handsomely, driving the enemy towards New Market, which is four miles distant, and where it is said they have a large force. We have captured 100 prisoners, killed and wounded several, with a loss on our part of only three killed and 11 wounded, among the latter two officers. I shall probably remain here tonight, ready to act as circumstances may require after the return of my cavalry reconnaissances. The mass of the enemy escaped under the cover of a dense fog, but our cavalry are still in pursuit, and I trust may succeed in capturing many more. This is a very advantageous position to cover and advance on Richmond and only fourteen and three-quarter miles distant, and I feel confident that, with reinforcements, I would march this army there in five days. I this instant learn that several brigades of the enemy are four miles from here on the Quaker Road, and I have taken steps to prepare to meet them. General Hooker's dispositions were admirable, and his officers and men displayed their usual gallantry. On the same day I telegraphed to General Halleck. Our troops have advanced 12 miles in one direction and 17 in another towards Richmond today. We have secured a strong position at Coggins Point, opposite our quartermaster's depot, which will effectively prevent the rebels from using artillery hereafter against our camps. I learned this evening that there is a force of 20,000 men about six miles back from this point, on the south bank of the river. What their object is I do not know, but will keep a sharp lookout on their movements. I am sending off sick as rapidly as our transports will take them. 
I am also doing everything in my power to carry out your orders to push reconnaissances towards the rebel capital and hope soon to find out whether the reports regarding the abandonment of that place are true. To the dispatch of 1 p.m. August 5th, the following answer was received August 6th. I have no reinforcements to send you. H.W. Halleck, Major General. And soon after the following, also from General Halleck. You will immediately send a regiment of cavalry and several batteries of artillery to Burnside's command at Aquia Creek. It is reported that Jackson is moving north with a very large force. End of Part 1 of Chapter 29